a live eight-week competition. It is called the American Song Contest. American, American Song, Song Contest. Contest. The quest begins. We represent Wyoming, Puerto Rico, Alaska, South Carolina. For best hit song. American Song Contest? But isn't it like Eurovision? Yep. And they did the whole points thing? Yep. Isn't it like that one movie where... Yep. Didn't Justin Timberlake do... Yep. All the above. This is how they hosted this, brought by these, to make one of America's live TV productions of the year. <laughs> Americans love competition and they certainly love music. Mix that with some passionate home state pride and putting on the spectacle, a show like Eurovision makes total sense stateside. Though it wasn't easy bringing an all singing, all dancing 60 something year old pensioner from Europe across the pond to do the same thing. But with some Swedish courage and some all American enthusiasm, we viewers were presented with a glittering two month long adventure with huge jaw dropping staging, pyro, platforms, and the all important climactic result. You know, not bad for a first edition. Plus, with these acts being well and truly established, emphasis was on finding artists at the top of the game, right through to the big names. I mean, there's a whole Michael Bolton. So, with European architects and American materials, just what did it take to make a show with its own stars earn its stripes? It all started back in 2006, when this guy, Ben Silverman, then a producer at NBC, saw the show and dreamt it needed to be over in the States. UK and European imports were doing really well stateside with him behind The Office, Big Brother, and The Weakest Link to name a few. And music competitions being a staple in the US TV calendar, it made sense. He says, I spent 20 years trying to pursue this. I just love the format. This has been the granddaddy of all music competition shows. Eurovision remains arguably the most popular and important to entertainment television show in the world. Fast forward 11 years and the Swedish TV music entertainment guru had just wiped the sweat off his brow producing the 2017 Eurovision Song Contest. Krista Bjorkman, a major force in Swedish TV behind the country's biggest music competition, Melody Festivalen, and producer of Eurovision since 2013, had teamed up with fellow Swedish producer Anders Lenhoff to put together the then 2017 show in Kyiv. Anders had the radical idea of taking it stateside, where it would surely be the world's next biggest thing and Swedish's next biggest import after ABBA, or IKEA, or Aquavit, or Ericsson. The Swedes are behind a lot of stuff, aren't they? Huh. Krista balked initially, but persistence from Anders turned to thought. Well, Anders and Krista teamed up with another heavyweight producer and presenter, Peter Setman, to businessify the idea and, armed with official rights from the EBU, sent the message stateside. Remember Ben Silverman? He caught wind of this and says, You're not doing this without me. Period. That's not gonna happen. Add this with NBC's music competition know how from The Voice and Songland where they picked up showrunner Audrey Morrissey and you have the beginnings of the crack team behind American Song Contest. And a hit movie helped whet the US appetite just a little bit more. So with all that excitement, the American Song Contest, basically a straight US copy of the Eurovision, right? Yeah, not quite. There's some similarities and some differences. Similarity, we got postcards, a useful device to help stagehands set the stage. But, like say a Melody Festival or similar other national finals, they're a bit more in-depth to help you, the viewer, get to know the artist. Difference. The flip side of postcards. We go more in-depth with acts as we proceed to the finals. In fact, as they progress through to the finals, it goes very X-Factor style, with insights into their family life and some shout-outs from their hometown, just showing how much it means to them. Similarity. Songs are no longer than 2 minutes 45 seconds, roughly around the Eurovision same limit of 3 minutes. Plus, acts are to have no more than 6 members in their band, which leads to a key difference, which of course is the fact that they are allowed to have non-act musicians and dancers to help amplify their act. You know, maybe this also acts as a way for Eurovision to see if this rule change can adapt to them. You never know. Difference. Staging is the birth from heat to heat. Unlike in Eurovision where costumes and staging stays relatively the same, states that progress have notable upgrades to really help them win. One more similarity. Along with qualifying results announced just before the show ends and in the following episode, we have live announced results in the grand final. A bit more on this later. Its key difference? 
We have Redemption, which saves a popular act that was otherwise knocked out by the jury or the audience result. Cue one of this year's most viral tracks, New Boot Goofing. And speaking of which, voting can be done by TikTok, something currently unsupported in Eurovision. So, same same, but different. But same, <laughs> even right down to the trophies. But here even the interstitials are different. Where the Eurovision host city would show off their city and their culture, here we have the Halftime Report which draws on the heritage of the sports punditry in the States and works well given the elements of competition and analysis. So I'm not really seen at Eurovision and especially not done with the hosts. In fact, you know what? This is probably another similarity as well. This being a very key signifier of US culture. Crucially, there are many key differences to help it make sense in an American market. So you have the fundamentals. Next, you'll need a stage. So we head to Hollywood, the home of America's entertainment, our host city, and to Universal Studios lot, our host venue for this very first edition. And of course, no expense was spared, but just how big was this show? In stage 24 and 25, had, had the set and where we did the broadcast from. This is Robin Hofwander, one of two multi-camera directors on this production, whose 20 plus year career has directed two Eurovisions, a whole stack of Melody Festivalens, and a wealth of massive Swedish TV productions. And 26 uh, was prop building. And stage 27 uh, uh, was prop holding area. We'll hear more from him a little bit later about him directing this huge production. Now the American Song Contest can be seen as the American road trip through music. And that aesthetic of cruising down wide roads was inspiration for the stage design. It incorporates a forced perspective angular design, flanked with six huge LED walls, plus one that splits into doors and disappear completely off stage, and hundreds upon hundreds of dazzling light fixtures. Plus, in true Eurovision style, an in-studio green room for the artists to get in on the party. This was designed by Julio Jimedo, notable for designing stages for MTV BMA's 2021, the EMA's 2021, the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards, to name a few, and is one of my personal favourite stage designers. At the heart of this view down the road is the sun. Eurofans, please relax. A giant sculpture at the end, made up of a huge rig of 46 fixtures of a specific wash light, which has the cool capability of splitting off into individual pixels with a really cool twinkling effect. Chuck some strobes on it, 130 of them, and you have an impressive and versatile centerpiece. An expansive and flexible set to showcase 56 very different designs and plenty of room for huge props, from Alexa falling off some stairs, to Nevada's Techno Mountains, to Alan Stones's Boulder. But we'll get to this. Production takes place over four huge stages in the Universal Studios lot. Stages 24 and 25 hosted the show itself, the set and all its production. Stage 26 was dedicated to building these huge props, the production's very own prop shop. Painting, building, welding was all done here. Stage 27 was a prop holding area and crew catering. This same stage has also been a filming location for Die Hard 2 and Apollo 13. In fact, they've all had some major blockbusters filmed here. 24 and 25 had the likes of Jurassic Park, The Lost World, Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> and The Flintstones. Plus, there was another dedicated stage area for the red carpet and the M&M world over in stage 747, which, as the name suggests, is also a set used for filming on the inside of airplanes. Speaking of M&Ms, sponsorship featured heavily in making this production possible, with branding and advertising absolutely everywhere. From T-Mobile's Do It For The Phones, to something that non-American viewers, including myself, found pretty fascinating, the cut to ad breaks after every song, which in turn helped to bring in the massive props on stage. Oh, oh, we'll be right back after this message. Fernand's live show show was brought to you by Lackstar. Lackstar goes a long way in making your dreams come true. Taking your Lackstar dose may or may not reduce the chances of heartburn, headache, sore throat, fever, incontinence, and restless pinky syndrome. Ask your doctor if this is right for you. Lackstar, always the right choice. Watching Eurovision, you get a real sense of how much blood, sweat, tears and props goes into an effective and point nabbing performance. If not prepared by the act themselves, teaming up with the creative house really makes all the difference, where they usually work on a handful at a time. Unless of course you've got something like you know, 15 plus to create. 
You know, it was uh, one of the toughest jobs of my life, but I would do it again in a heartbeat. This is John Zyka, supervisor and art director of this production. He's responsible for the creative production houses, looking after this, this, and this. There were three uh, three teams of creative producers on the show that uh, that you know the fifty six artists were sort of divvied up uh, into. Everyone on the show like has the chops. Nearly every act in this production had massive or immersive staging. We had platforms, then we had massive platforms. There were lasers, even custom made pieces, immersive graphics, flowers, and of course you can't forget a good old golden pyro shower. This was truly to showcase just how high quality these artists were. Yes, absolutely and definitely including New Boot Goofin. But of course they had some impressive backing to make this happen. A segment of the producing team was from The Voice. They were able to use a lot of their labor and their infrastructure that they have set up for The Voice. They're used to building 10 or 11 sets a week. One or two of these needed some extra insight. Alexa had uh, two flying moments, which you know was a little bit more complicated. So we had to bring in a stunt coordinator who had you know specific winches to to fly her safely. We also were able to accomplish some quite large sets, which was nice. Alan Stone set was sort yeah. of deceivingly, uh, deceivingly large, you know, it was, <laughs> it was, it was this sort of massive, they called it the barge. And it was this massive platform that, you know, came out in eight pieces. And with such scale, your typical 40 second Eurovision changeover simply wouldn't be enough with up to five minutes built into schedule to make this happen. A lot of bodies moving stuff. So that was another thing that, you know, came up in the in the design process was we couldn't build something that couldn't come on and off in, in five minutes. Fans of Alexa were mesmerized by just how impressive her performance was, but every week seemed to get better and better. As uh, seen here also with New Hampshire, for example. As we knew who was moving forward, we started to have those discussions of, oh, how do we, you know, how do we add to this? Like Alexa, the the team that did the creative for that was House of Sam, and they they had actually thought a little bit when they started about, oh, you know, if she goes through, we want to have this sort of, um, you know from Alice to the Red Queen kind of storyline. You know, sometimes the management would kind of say, hey, we really want to showcase this and this and this. Like, how can we, you know, how can we do that? And a lot of times the artists had ideas, you know, uh, Tanel was a perfect example. Yeah. Um, you know, she really wanted to bring in more of her culture and more, more of her heritage. And, um, you know, so as she made it through, uh, she actually reached out to a group of Polynesian dancers that she knew and she, you know, she knew, uh, you know, some fire dancers and we were able to get one of them. Plus, there was a pleasant attention to detail on each one. In my opinion, some entries did really well in bringing the energy on stage and delivering it on screen. One in particular threw absolutely everything at it. Texas featured immersive graphics a la Beyonce, included props and opened up the stage and got real up close and personal where cameras were well and truly part of the choreography. Now, speaking of all up and close and personal, okay. So you have the staging and how it feels whilst in the studio, but watching it at home and how it translates on screen, that's the big ticket. Robin, along with Krista and co, brought the Swedish know-how of Eurovision through to the US. This production, inspired by the creative visual output seen at Eurovision, brought Live Edit, a multi-camera switching program over to the States. Live Edit is, is a must on a show like this, like, like Eurovision, due to consistency and like the, the production process uh, of the performances with viewing rooms and discussion shot numbers and it just makes everything so much easier. Live Edit already cut its teeth on the 2021 Junior Revision and Melody Festival in turn with you. Hey Wisconsin! Their entry comes up up top with 121 shots in its performance and conversely perhaps the easiest one to cut Oh, maybe not. It's an art to this. Coming in with only one shot all the way through, led entirely by Steadicam, it's Alabama. But Robin, part of the multi camera directing duo this year, he has his favourite ones to direct as well. The favourites I have are not that I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for them to win, it's more mm -hmm. like 
these are really fun to do. Alexa was one of them. I think we nailed it pretty much the first week. Uh, so that one was fun. And also I like Crystal Method was so fun to do. And I did a lot of jump zoom cuts uh, in, in live edit, which was great. All this to handle a 14 camera production. In fact, here's Robin to break them down. From number one was uh, an ordinary jib. Number two was uh, a rake close-up camera. Three, frontal close-up. Four, frontal close-up. Five, slightly higher angle frontal, more, more of a wide shot camera. Six was a tower cam uh, center downstage. Seven was the rail cam downstage. Eight was the overhead, overhead track, track camera, the, the Eurovision camera. Yeah, of course. I really, I really want, I really wanted to get that in just for the Eurovision look. Nine, uh, nine was a rake close-up camera from from stage left. Ten was the super techno. Eleven and twelve steady cams. Thirteen, fourteen handhelds. Compared with Eurovision, this production is smaller, but just as big. There's no second OB van as backup, and rather all backup is on the same truck with the ability to switch over control through the director's laptop. Plus, there is one huge upside to production in the scorching LA heat. All the props are held for the show. The props are held outside, just in the open air. It's like, okay, it's not raining here. <laughs> it's, it's sunshine. You can trust it. Absolutely. And in, yeah. and, and in Sweden, I mean, the props would have been destroyed in an hour. Here's some great creative camera direction examples. New Mexico incorporating a fisheye lens. Nevada with all the crazy effects and more. And Texas getting really immersive and check out this camera spin. Shout out to Randy Gomez Jr. Check him out on Instagram for a really cool insight into some of the incredible steady cam shots seen in this production. Okay, so director, check. Creative director, check. But there's a secret source that makes all the extra visual difference. Our lighting, our lighting designer Noah Mitz, you know, obviously worked very strongly with them. They have the light designer in the OB truck. I think that is wonderful. I in in Sweden, the light designer is always in the in the venue at at the front of the house. Yeah. Um, and here I can just turn around. Hey Noah, could we la 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 la? Yeah, sure. Good. So there's no reason to sit in the venue and like, ooh, look at all these beams, it's beautiful, when the camera don't see them. So I, so I think it, it makes a lot of sense to, to have the light designer in the, in the truck. And as always, it's time for my list faves. Is it you, is it me? Is it you, is it me? Who could it be, who could it be? I yeah, don't know. there you go. <laughs> it's the voting. Snoop adding his own twist to proceedings is really fun to watch. The big grand final had loads of really cool touches to the otherwise well-known Eurovision tradition. For example, how to group the 12s into regions, keeping the artist a spokesperson, and the great Eurovision replication of jury's results first, then the public vote. This always excites me from year to year, so imagine the thrill the first time viewer must feel. The graphics, as you can see right here, I'm a massive fan of the vibrant design treatment of the show. From the tone of voice to welcome the viewer to the states with an animated state shape, very NBC meets Olympics, to the song titles. Like the road trip inspiration for the stage, it filters through to here with a great state identifier, your registration plate. Each had their own little quirk and fun to really give its own flavor. Really well done. Then there's the show itself. The ASC halftime report, a nice nod to the sports punditry culture seen a lot in the states and the analysis of the goings on seen a lot in the US sports programs. Even as light jokey comparisons, in its own way it's like commentary, which, something which you've noticed has no need for in this production. And my favourite looks in this few words as possible. Texas, graphics, camera, staging, very strong. Massachusetts, stunning lighting design with an icy blue key light and a world of lasers. Mississippi, a very modern skin opening and lots of pyro. Nevada, a trippy acid visual landscape, well directed. Oregon, dancing cups and smoothie bribing. <laughs> the American response to the Eurovision Latvian entry of 2022 maybe. Instead of meat, I eat veggie. Plus, the extreme happiness of Kelly and Snoop after every song 
and their getting up twos in the green room. So that's your lot. That's been a creative road trip into the valleys of the American Song Contest. Usually I'll do my little creative closer, but I'll let John take this one. I think that we put out an amazing product. I think we did an amazing show that really pushed the level of production value on you know, a weekly singing competition show. Our producers wanted this to feel like the Grammys. They wanted it to feel like billboards. They didn't want it to feel like, you know, a talent show. They wanted, we wanted to celebrate the artists and really showcase them in their best light. And I think we absolutely smashed that out of the park. Couldn't have said it better myself. A massive thank you to John and Robin helping us star start this episode and It's American Stripes. What parts did you guys like? Why do you bust in your moves like Snoop? Or why are you looking bemused like Michael? I want to hear him, stick him in the comment section below. Check out all my previous episodes here and a like and subscribe will be downright goofing. Yes. <laughs> Till next time people, always remember to hit record and stay alive. Peace. I'm going to go to the final.